Okay, the recording has come on. Uh, good morning and welcome everyone to the class today. Uh, let's take a moment to pray and then we will uh, get started. Okay, uh, may I ask uh, maybe Kiran, why don't you pray and then we will start. Yes, sir. Father God, thanking you for everything, Father God. Thanking you for the day and weekend, Father God. Thanking you for your word and all your uh, your your words, Father God. Thanking you, Father God. Uh, thank thanking you the class, Father God. Thanking you, sir, and all the students, Father God. Help us to understand all subject, Father God, and apply it to your kingdom work, Father. Thanking you for all things, Almighty Jesus' name. We pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so in this course on urban church planting, we are now in the final section of what um, I had uh, planned for us to cover. Um, so we talked about, um, we, there was the introduction section. We gave an introduction to um, ch uh, church planting. Uh, we then talked about the natural and uh, spiritual dynamics that are involved. We then talked about the practical issues related to church planting. So we went through a lot of practical things. Then we talked about the spiritual side to church planting. And then the last section, we talked about the personal life, uh, the personal life of the church planter, and the personal preparation <clears throat> and those kinds of things. So what I wanted to do, and then I felt we needed to add one section, which is more on uh, on how do we look, I mean, we look forward. And that's mainly because of what has happened the last two years, um, you know, because of the pandemic, uh, how we do church, how we do ministry uh, has been impacted quite a bit. Uh, we've We've all had to, change a lot of things very quickly, uh, adapt uh, and make changes. And so now, you know, when we look forward, what would it be, what would some of the things we need to keep in mind uh, as we talk about church, church life, church planting, starting ministries, uh, what are some of the things to keep in mind? So I wanted to talk about that and then we will do a full uh, review. That means I'll just quickly, you know, take one one class, or maybe three quarters or of a class lecture, uh, to quickly review everything we've covered in this course, and then after that, I'm just, uh, you know, we will wrap up the course, and I'll just give you uh, time to work on assignments. So I will uh, prepare the assignments, put it online. So month of November, we'll just uh, basically keep it for that. We, um, if if we finish everything tomorrow. Uh, then we may not need to have lectures in November. Uh, it will be more of uh, finishing, of more of me sending you, you know, three assignments, and then you can just uh, take time to work on the assignments uh, during November. So in this class, this lecture, I just wanted to, you know, think through with us on, you know, when we look forward. Um, how would the ministry, church planting, or starting a Christian ministry, especially in urban centers, how, what would it look like? And what are some of the things to keep in mind, especially churches, uh, the church having gone through, you know, all of, almost two years now uh, of uh, the pandemic and so on. Now, um, I'm I'm going to basically be using. Uh, a summary of a book uh, that uh, a person named Thomas Rainer wrote. Uh, he's like a, uh, how would you describe him? Like like a church, church planting, church growth expert, or you know, you use the word consultant. Uh, somebody who, is, who who advises, who works with other pastors and churches, and helping them with, you know, basically. Uh, church planting, church growth, those kinds of things. So he wrote a book, uh, uh, which let me just share this. Now I put the PDF on, on online, 
uh, in the class. So he's written, he wrote a book, uh, The Post-Quarantine Church, uh, Six Urgent Challenges and Opportunities That Will Determine the Future of Your Congregation. So, um, you know, I, I thought it was just nice to use this summary to, um, these are just thoughts to think about. You know, I'm, I'm not saying everything will apply to every part of the world. Uh, this, of course, was written uh, from a North American uh, church perspective. So it, a lot of the ideas and thoughts are coming from that background. Uh, but I think it is useful uh, for us to just see you know, what has been said, what has been written, and see um, you know, if some of these things would be relevant for us, uh, at least to think about as we plan on, okay, after the quarantine, now that we are coming out of the quarantine uh, and we're looking at church or Christian ministry uh, in an urban context, uh, what are some of the things we need to keep in mind? And of course, um, you know, this person, Thomas Renner, is, is a very experienced person. I mean, he's, he's helped many churches go through this and work worked with them before even the pandemic. And then, of course, during the pandemic. So uh, he's like an expert and it's, it's good, to, good to listen. And, and to see what he has to say, right? So, so he's obviously addressing the same challenge, which uh, I think many, many pastors, church leaders, church planters, uh, Christian ministers will be thinking about, okay, after the quarantine, what, what are the challenges going to look like? What are the opportunities going to look like? Uh, how can we start preparing for that? And so that's the objective of today's uh, thing. So just, this is just a summary. So uh, it's, it's a, quick way for us to learn um, the main points of the book. Uh, so one is, uh, he talks about gather differently and better. So the the fact is, you know, the, the pandemic uh, forced all of us, all churches, uh, to realize that, uh, you know, while in-person gathering is important, uh, church can still happen without the building. You know, we realized that. Uh, we realized that, uh, you know, to some extent, we can use the tools that are there and uh, and reach people, serve people, and we could gather in many different ways. You know, uh, prayer groups could meet online, uh, seminars could happen online, workshops could happen online, services could happen online, and so. Uh, so the idea is. Uh, and then also that uh, in some cases, uh, church facilities could be used uh, for more than just worship services. Uh, it could be used to serve the community in other ways. You know, um, uh, 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 some churches, I'm not saying uh, everyone, but some, some churches who had their buildings, uh, they opened up for, um, you know, helping people with, needs during the pandemic, whether it's giving them food, clothing, assisting people in various ways during the pandemic. Uh, not So the buildings were used not just for church services, uh, but they were used to serve the community in, you know, in different ways. So that is something we can consider continuing, you know, where possible. So, so gathering differently and gathering better. Uh, the second thought is to seize the opportunity to reach the digital world. So again, this was a learning, uh, like we mentioned, we were forced to uh, move online. And, uh, and so a lot of churches have developed uh, to certain degrees, uh, different, different degrees, um, the ability to reach people in the digital world. That means those who are online. So we must continue using this opportunity. And so, you know, just for uh, helping us understand, he categorizes, you know, people in three kinds of groups. There will be those who are digital only, you know. So there are some people who have, uh, who have been con connecting to church online and they may continue online. You know, they, they may not come back, come to in-person gatherings. Uh, some of these would be people who are physically unable to come. You know, maybe they're elderly 
or they are in, a, you know, shut in there you know, for various reasons. They are unable to go out of their homes. Uh, so for them, uh, they will continue only online. And uh, so we would um, need to think of ways and, you know, how do we continue to serve these people, right? Uh, they will, so we, we are not going to be able to move them to attend church service. Uh, they have uh, become comfortable with uh, the online service. And also it's, uh, oh, they may have some other limitations that keep them from coming uh, to the in-person gatherings. So uh, when you're doing a work in a city, you're planting a church, you're starting a ministry, you're doing that. Uh, well, there are going to be people who will want to or who will connect just online, digital only. And then you have another group of people who uh, he calls as uh, digitally transitioning. That means uh, they are connected online and they've started connecting online but slowly uh, they will be open to attend uh, in person right so uh, um, so we need a strategy uh, to serve these kinds of people that means um, they have connected or they may connect to us online and then slowly they will you know, they, we need to encourage them. They are will, they would be willing to come and worship uh, in person. So we have to think about them. So even in our church planting or uh, ministries that we plan to start or will start in uh, urban centers, we need to keep these kinds of people in mind. And everybody or the remaining remaining part of the group will remain as dual citizens. It's kind of funny he uses this, but it is interesting. That is, they will connect both digitally and in person. That means they will come to the Sunday services. They will come to in-person gatherings like workshops, seminars, different things. But uh, as an, whenever they need, they will also engage digitally, you know, because people have become used to, you know, watching things online, whether it's YouTube videos, whether it's reading content online, listening to content online. Um, they've become used to it, uh, especially in the last two years, because we, we were forced to do that. So uh, uh, every person really is going to be connecting with the church or with the ministry as a dual citizen. That means we cannot get rid of this digital connect. We cannot. It's there to stay, uh, and so every everything we do as a uh, in the church or as a Christian ministry must keep this in mind that uh, uh, people are going to connect both physically and digitally uh, to the church or to the ministry. So uh, we have to be able to serve them in both ways. We cannot just say we are moving only in person. No. Um, the digital will continue even, sorry, in time to come. And uh, very, very importantly, uh, he talks about praying for each of these three groups. That means, you know, um, even as we get uh, uh, do our work in such a way that uh, we are we're engaging with people both in person and digitally, uh, it's going to make us very busy. Uh, because, uh, you know, it's almost like you're reaching, you're forced to reach multiple congregations, right? You're, so it's the work is become more. Uh, you can't, we can't think of only, okay, people will come and meet me and it's everything going to be in person. No, everything we do, we have to think in both these terms, uh, per, in person and digital. So obviously work is going to be more, uh, we have to pray for all of these people, we have to pray intentionally for people of whom we are going to reach online, digitally. And uh, so um, uh, very, very correctly, um, uh, Thomas Rayner uh, uh, encourages us to uh, prayerfully, prayerfully seek ways to be more, uh, um, uh, to engage in missions in the digital world. That's very important. And he wants us uh, not to get, uh, you know, get trapped in digital busyness. You know, so 
the digital world is very engaging, but it also can really take away a lot of time. So be careful of that. Uh, pray more and think of how to reach people in both these uh, areas. So, and you know, there are some thoughts here that you could uh, think through on, um, uh, on applying each of these ideas and so on. So basically he says, uh, think of the different communities uh, uh, that, uh, that, uh, that you would reach uh, since the pandemic, how you can use social media, how you can reach non-Christian with through the digital world. Thirdly, third important thing we have to keep in mind as we move into a post-quarantine world, uh, whether we are doing church planning or starting any kind of Christian ministry, is to reconnect with the community around our church, or the, the local church. So uh, while we have been using online and digital medium uh, to reach people wherever they are, which means, you know, the church could be in one location, you could be reaching or serving people in, you know, various parts of the city or even the country or even the world. Uh, once you move into this post-quarantine world, the, the neighborhood church, the people who are serving the community uh, will become very important because people are going to rediscover uh, people are going to reconnect, you know, within the community there because people, okay, we've missed each other. We, we need to connect with people. We need, we need, you know, uh, we need to get together. So community becomes important, and uh, we should not forget that the community around the church is very important. Just because we have been thinking digitally, thinking about online, thinking about these things. It is so important to reconnect with community. And, you know, uh, even for us, uh, after we have opened uh, services, now it's been for one month, uh, just or, or maybe five Sundays, uh, one of the things that uh, even I have uh, encountered talking to people is uh, that people have really missed, uh, at least the people that I've spoken to, people have really missed that, uh, personal connect and uh, uh, it has uh, for many people it has left them a little disoriented you know in the sense that uh, uh, this online church and uh, all of that was okay for a certain period of time uh, you know people knew it was a necessity that was the only thing we could do but uh, it left uh, I'm not saying this is going to be true for everybody, but for many of the people that I've spoken to, it, it left left them a little disoriented, you know, in in the sense that they were longing for um, that personal connect, just to meet people and worship together and talk to people, and you know, uh, so this will be true everywhere, you know, uh, because we are. We need those connects connections, and so it is so important to reconnect with the community, uh, both the church community as well as people around the community. And one of the things uh, Thomas Rainer says is uh, he refers to as neighborhood churches. That means uh, people who are serving their immediate uh, neighborhood, the people around, uh, they will become very important because you know um like we said people are longing for that they want to you know, they want somebody to care for them somebody to uh, uh mentor them somebody to uh you know just journey together through the life through life so um we must uh, while we are thinking about you know reaching more people and so on we must uh, reconnect with uh the neighborhoods, uh, homes, uh, with people, uh, make it personal because people are longing for it. They're looking for it, right? So, uh, um, and so we need to 
do that. And also be it makes the church be more outward focused, uh, looking to reach people in their neighborhoods, cities, towns, communities. Right. So that's another important thing for us to keep thinking about. Right. So think of some of the ways your church can be of more positive influence in the community. Uh, think about, uh, you know, uh, so so there's, you know, the slow erosion as people are slowly dropping out of church because of this lack of connect. Uh, but, you know, if that's happening, then we can think of how do we reach out to those people? Right, who have been slowly dropping out of church because of a lack of connect. And um, uh, think about the, the comeback of the neighborhood church and how can, you know, how can we leverage this in a very positive way, basically to connect with people in our immediate communities and neighborhoods, right? because people are longing for that. So that's the third thing. Fourthly, uh, he has already, we've already mentioned this, but uh, we need to pray uh, and uh, uh, seek God even more. Uh, just as during the pandemic, uh, there was definitely more prayer, prayer for people, prayer for the challenges that we were going through. Uh, we need to continue with that uh, uh, prayer, right? So that's the next um, uh, uh, thought that is presented to us. To continue with that prayer, uh, continue, uh, you know, uh, in, in, in those in those intense seeking of God, and uh, uh, don't let that go down. And also, because of the pandemic, people were forced to pray or, or meet for prayer in very innovative ways, a different ways. And mostly, uh, people met for prayer online. So one of the things he suggests is how about continuing that, you know, uh, that form of prayer, if it's possible. Uh, surely we want to meet in person and pray, but um, we can think about that online prayer, continuing that uh, that mode of prayer whenever it is uh, useful. But the whole point was the pandemic forced people to increase in their intensity and commitment to prayer. And so let's sustain that and keep building on that and keep going to new levels. So thoughts here, think about uh, prayer ministries that took place in your church during the pandemic. Uh, uh, think about whether they are still present today. Uh, think about church members who may join you in praying uh, for your church and community. Uh, think about technologies your church used during the pandemic and uh, the ways those technologies can be used for prayer ministries today. In other words, uh, you know, continue with that seal. Uh, number five, is uh, uh, to rethink of uh, using the facilities that are there for new opportunities. So the idea here is that um, if churches or those churches that have church facilities, um, uh, if we can think of new ways to serve the community, serve people, um, uh, then we can, you know, we can rethink of how these. Um, facilities can be used to serve people. So some thoughts here is think about how we church facilities were used before the pandemic and how that is changing and might change more. Uh, think of ways that your church may partner with, organi with another organization in the using of those facilities. Uh, think about how digital streaming of services during the pandemic might change the future of your worship services in your physical facility. So also, you know, just leveraging the church facility and keeping it in line with what we're doing. We are going to continue with the di digital streaming uh, online. So if the facilities can tailor towards that ministry in an ongoing manner, also if the facilities we have can be used in partnership with other organizations. So rethink of that. Now, I, I, I haven't really put too much thought into it, you know, APC, we don't own any buildings as yet, uh, but this definitely uh, is um, uh, something to think about that for those churches who have their own facilities, uh, if uh, you can see, you know, uh, ways by which you can use that to serve people and also tailor the experience inside for an online audience. 
And um, the, the next one is mm, make lasting changes that will make a difference. So the fact is, uh, as we get into a post-quarantine world, uh, a lot of the changes that we must be are forced to make and some of these changes we don't even know as yet only as we you know, start moving in you know month after month um, we are going to begin to understand what are the changes we need to make what are the things we need to do differently um, uh, to adapt to just a new way of things uh, the way new ways in which people are beginning to engage uh, interact and so on but then uh, as we make these changes, uh, it is important that we do things that will last and that will make a difference for the long term, right? So whatever comes, you know, make sure that prayer and God's word, uh, you know, are, are remain the focus, remain the, 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 the most important things, make sure those things remain important. You know, the preaching of the word, the discipling of people, um, to keep those things important, even though we are going to be making changes uh, in, in, in how the services are done and so on. Make sure that uh, we keep these things uh, important. Now, some of the things he does um, list out here is, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, the, the Sometimes people to uh, uh, people refuse to change. Uh, sometimes they don't see the urgency to change. Uh, sometimes uh, they they fail to get people in, influential people in the church involved who can influence other people in the church to change. Uh, sometimes there's no clear vision. Uh, uh, sometimes people can get discouraged because they don't see you know uh, short term wins. They don't see. Uh, progress happening so people get discouraged sometimes we fail to communicate to the congregation to people what we are doing uh, where we are going how we are going to go forward uh, or sometimes we're giving too much uh, attention to those who are opposed to change and uh, and we let them override the change so uh, just some things here to make sure that we don't keep ourselves from moving forward, from making changes that need to be made. Right. And um, well, let's see here now. I think, yeah, uh, uh, the key thoughts here are, think about how receptive to change your church was during the quarantine and note the lessons you can learn from that period. Now, how did people react and respond to the fact that we had to move to online services? Uh, we have to move, you know, giving of offering online, um, we had to, uh, you know, in many cases, minister to people online, when people wanted counseling, when people wanted prayer, uh, you know, we did a lot of that online, uh, and, uh, you know, people were receptive to it. So could some of these things continue? For instance, uh, you know, uh, as of now, we have continued to do all our giving online. We haven't moved back to the old form of, you know, sending a basket around or a bag around for people to put online, uh, put offering into the bag. Uh, I just feel that, you know, giving online is uh, because people have been used to it now for many, many months. Uh, it's a good thing for us as well because uh, everything goes, the money goes straight into the bank account and there is no need for you know, the manual process of counting and account writing down and physically going to the bank to deposit. Now, uh, yeah, there may be some people who want it, but as uh, the physical offering bag. But if we can just continue with online giving, it will you know, reduce the amount of work and um, just you also make things more secure because it goes directly into the bank. Uh, think about you know, uh, uh, online meetings. And now, of course, we want to meet people on in person, but uh, in order to save people's time and all of that, we could, you know, wherever necessary, we could do meetings online. And uh, people will be open to it. You know, it's a change, and but that change has become permanent, and, but it's a beneficial change. For instance, on Saturday, 
uh, I, I did a meeting with our children's church uh, leaders, and we did it online. You know, I, I didn't in the past. I would say, "Oh, let's meet in the church office at this time," and they will have to spend, you know, maybe half an hour, sometimes forty-five minutes, uh, just to get to the church office for that meeting. But now it is so simple. You know, we all just connected online, and we spent an hour discussing things, planning for the future, and it all worked out fine. You know, so people are used to that, and uh, so you know, there are these changes that can. Um, benefit us, benefit people, which we will continue, and uh, and uh, uh, but then we don't want to lose out on the core things, the core important things of you know uh, God's word of fellowship and so on. Right? Um, so think about some of the beneficial changes that have already taken place, and you can continue with these things. Don't have to necessarily go back to old ways uh, and uh, and uh, think about some way that your church may face some of its greatest challenges uh, in the post-quarantine world. So what could become a challenge in the future? Uh, so we had to think about those things. Right. So uh, I like these nine uh, summary, the uh, nine points uh, that, uh, uh, that he's made, which we will go through. So uh, to summarize, some things will never change in the post-quarantine church. That means, you know, what's important, like with the word, uh, Jesus, the word of God, prayer, uh, all those things. Those things will never change. But uh, what could we or what should we be thinking about as we get ready for uh, doing church planting or Christian ministry in the post-quarantine world? What should we be thinking about? One. Uh, keep things very, very simple. Um, uh, uh, that means uh, stay focused on what's important. Do a few things well, both digitally and in person. So rather than trying to do a lot of different things, do a few things, but make sure you do it to serve people who are online as well as in person. Secondly, uh, uh, he said, you know, shares that we need to be uh, intentional about reaching our communities. That means uh, make every effort to reach the neighborhoods, the communities where people are. Uh, people are going to be looking forward to that and getting to churches that are close to them. Um, uh, so he uh, also talks about the neighborhood churches. So um, uh, the idea is, you know, uh, these churches, neighborhood churches, churches that are serving effectively in their communities uh, will become very important. So think about that. Um, number four, multi will multiply. That means uh, he's talking about the multi-site movement. That means uh, a church having multiple campuses or locations. So he said um, this will continue because uh, because of the fact that people are wanting something close to them in their communities, in their neighborhoods, and uh, where they can connect. And also technology, you know, allows for this. You know, you can have multi-site churches, multi-campuses, and so on. So this will continue. Um, uh, leaders, um, staff and leadership, uh, we will need to focus more on digital proficiency. That means even as pastors, as leaders, uh, we will need to be able to use uh, digital oops, uh, digital technology uh, for uh, ministering to people. So uh, that will be an important part of how we are going to serve people. And we need to have proficiency. We need to be able to use um, digital technology to reach people. And number six, uh, there will be stragglers. That means people who once were part of the church, uh, but because of the pandemic, um, uh, they have become disconnected with the church, uh, or you know they're kind of now on the fence. They're not like really red hot, zealous for worship, and so they, they're called stragglers. Uh, they will also they will become a subject of outreach and focus. That means how do we get them back? Right, these people who are now on the fence, they've kind of you know become felt disconnected with the church. Uh, because obviously yeah, nobody was there. I mean, the connect was not there. And so we need to 
uh, reach out to them and focus on them. Um, digital worship services. So now uh, we need to think about making sure that our services are uh, serving people who are connecting digitally. So that will continue to be important, digital worship services, because like we said earlier, uh, there will be a group of people who will only be able to connect digitally. They may not come in person. So our services should be uh, tailored for them. Uh, the training of people for ministry will also change because uh, 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 of course, we do need the core core the training, uh, but we also need training uh, on on practical things. On uh, you know, on uh, like we're saying, how do we leverage technology? How do we, um, you know, how do we lead through change? Uh, how do we manage? Uh, how do we lead a church and a congregation through these times? These kinds of things. So the training we have to give to people will also have to adapt. Mm, to uh, you know, to what is being what is required in, in this new uh, time that we are entering into, and then he also talks about that uh, you know as as uh, we have more uh, multi-site churches, uh, we will also need more pastors to take care of these new campuses, and uh, these pastors will take care of the new campuses. Uh, they don't have to be in the same. Uh, carry the same leadership responsibilities as the main leadership pastor, but they will just be campus pastors. Um, so um, they, they don't have to necessarily be strong leaders, but they, as long as they can pastor a, a venue or a campus, you know, that, that is fine. The leadership is provided by the main pastor. So, uh, you know, we will need these kinds of pastors as well. So, that, in a sense, is what uh, some of the thoughts that uh, that are shared in this book. Uh, I'm not saying this is a, a a complete answer to everything that we will face, but I think it's a it's a nice uh, you know a nice effort to get us to think on uh, some of these things that uh, will change and uh, will be different. Uh, as we begin to move into a post-quarantine world, and as we think about starting churches, starting ministries, doing ministry in the urban centers, uh, I think um, this book captures a lot of important thoughts uh, that we could use. So let me pause here and uh, see if you have any uh, thoughts and comments on this about uh, a post-quarantine world, some of the things that are shared in this book. Any thoughts, any comments? Kiran says, online meeting also best. Kiran, why do you feel online meetings are, are, are good or are the best? All right, I'm not sure if Kiran heard my question. Um, anybody yes, sir. So in person also is good, but a different part, online meeting, we can connect like different state, different part. So I said, sir, online meeting. Oh, okay, best. you can connect. Yeah, you can connect to church services and anywhere else. And yeah, that's true. So online gives us that uh, tremendous advantage. We can connect to a church service anywhere uh, in the world and be a part of it. True, true. Uh, any other thoughts uh, here based on what we covered today on, uh, you know, doing ministry, uh, especially I think in terms of church planting and Christian ministry in urban centers uh, in a post-quarantine world? Any other thoughts anybody wants to share? Kanan, Dave, Aaron. Uh, the, the thing is, in person is better, but uh, regarding the post quarantine, uh, before, uh, before the pandemic, uh, we 
we didn't have a digital system. I mean, we didn't have recording and other things. And yet we know we have a lot of members who are not in Nepal. I mean, who have um, uh, gone out or moved out of the country for for different various reasons. They've gone for work, they've, gone for, they've resettled themselves outside. And this, uh, when we, because of the pandemic, our church moved into uh, a digital world. And before we, we actually we were, uh, we didn't want to record, we didn't want to upload in a, uh, on YouTube or Facebook because of some security issues. Mm. But because of the pandemic, we are forced to do that. Not only um, for, for church service only, but uh, it helped us uh, to, to reach all those people who uh, we, we, ha we have had lost uh, contact with, mm. those who have, have went out and um, sometimes they, they wanted to have, they, they wanted to have the service where we weren't able to uh, just on the phone or uh, talking to phone is not enough. Mm. But, uh, because of this, I think it, it, it did help those who those of those who are not in uh, currently in Nepal or those who are cannot go to uh, a service even when they are in uh, in uh, outside of Nepal uh, when they when they go to their uh, when they go to different countries they have uh, different uh, rules and regulations like in uh, like in Middle East uh, uh, we we have service on Saturday but their holiday is is on Friday. Mm. In some major countries, the holiday is on Sunday. So because of that, also, but uh, yeah, because of the pandemic, it, it gave us this opportunity to to um, move the whole um, church into digital world. Mm -hmm. and it, it has helped um, in the 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 area that I I mentioned. Mm -hmm. and, I think uh, in the upcoming days, it definitely will help our church, even though we are not yet um, physically open, but uh, it, it really gives us some kind of uh, perspectives to mm. look forward. Um, yeah. yeah, that's very good. That's very good to hear. You know, as, uh, people who are in different parts of the world could reconnect back to the home church. Uh, that's wonderful. And, uh, you know, uh, and of course, during, especially during the pandemic, it's going to be a source of spiritual encouragement and strength. And so there's that reconnect that's taken place because you've moved things online. And that's, that's really good. And now you can continue, you know, continue serving them, ministering to them wherever they are, which are part of the world. That's good. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I see the question uh, from Kanan, when do we reopen uh, in-person classes for the Bible College? Uh, Kanan, we were thinking of January uh, initially, uh, but we were, you know, we just, we didn't announce it. Uh, we had to make a final decision uh, just from a safety perspective, because, you know, in our Bible College, uh, it's, it's a dormitory style. We don't have individual rooms uh, for students. Uh, so it is uh, something we have to keep in mind. Now, there are certain colleges that have opened up, uh, but from what I've heard, um, you know, they, they, they do weekly testing. They, and they have separate, they have basically rooms where two, two or three students are there. So even if one of them uh, uh, is unwell, you know, they can quarantine safely um, and they're not allowed to go out of that room for, you know, until they recover and all of that. Uh, which is something we cannot do, given our our hostels, our dormitory style, um, and um, we don't have individual rooms for students and things like that. So that's one reason why we are, you know, not hurrying into this. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, we will. Uh, this week, I think um, we will make a final decision. So we wanted to wait till October to see, especially also what the government is doing, what is what permissions the government is giving to um, educational institutions, things like that. So based on that, we will also be able to make our decision uh, because, of course, we have to be aligned to uh, government permissions and regulations. 
Um, so the thing is, um, there's a lot of testing. You know, some colleges are, you know, require students to uh, be tested um, regularly and all of that. So we don't want, we can't keep pushing our Bible college students to go do all that. So that's why we are uh, thinking what to do. Uh, so most likely, most likely, we will send an email, we'll announce it, but most likely we'll continue with online classes next semester, just because of the reasons I mentioned, and then uh, get back to in-person classes in August of next year. Most likely that will be the decision, but uh, we will decide uh, when, we, when we have a meeting uh, and then announce it. Is that okay? All right, so, so what we will do tomorrow is um, tomorrow uh, we will do a quick review or we'll do a review of the entire course. Uh, just go over everything, sort of fresh our minds on it. So, um, you know, you, you, we can take that with us. And, you know, uh, I, I know right now you may not be able to apply these things immediately because, you know, uh, churches are just getting back and uh, ministry is just getting back. But, you know, keep these things in mind. And then, uh, you know, uh, in the future, when you have chance to get into real, get back into ministry personally, you can apply these things uh, to the work you are doing. Um, so tomorrow will be a review of the course. And with that, we will finish. And November will be a time just for uh, assessments, which I will create and you could uh, finish that off by the end of the month. Is that okay? Uh, let's close and we will dismiss, please. Um, yeah. Kanan, is your phone okay? Can you pray? Uh, is that? Oh. Okay. Hmm. I can't hear you, Kanan. I think. Okay, kind of, um, it's yeah, it's a little noisy. You couldn't hear, but yeah, uh, Dave, would you pray and we will close and dismiss, please? Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. Once again, Lord Jesus, we thank you that we had this opportunity to be in this class, learn from you. Yes, your. Son, Lord Jesus, you are appointed Son, Lord Jesus, whatever we've learned today. Whatever all those challenges that we are about to face Lord Jesus, in our life, Lord God, we, we give our life and everything that we have into your hand, Lord Jesus. Mm -hmm. You help each one of us, Lord Jesus, as we move ahead, Lord God. Give us your wisdom, your revelation, your understanding, Lord Jesus, so that we can respond in every um, situation according to your will and your um, understanding, Lord God. As we depart, Lord Jesus, I, I pray that you uh, be with each one of us the rest of the day and help each one of us. In the mighty name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Pastor. Yeah, thank you, Dev. Thank you. Thank you, Conan. No problem. Thank you, Karen. God bless you all. I'll see you tomorrow. Bye now.